All right, well, thanks, thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you guys tonight. Um, uh, I, uh, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have a lot to do or have a lot to talk about signing rockets, but I can certainly answer questions about them at the end and I've got pictures and show that stuff as well. I, I, was, I was looking at uh, mostly talking about space weather and, and the phenomena associated with that. So, uh, but uh, this is your talk. So as we get to the end, you have questions, I will try to answer as many questions as I can. So let me uh, pull up my presentation here. Uh, this, this is always the question, does it do the right one? So can you see the regular one or with the, the presenters one? We I see the your, regular I one. See, I see your screen. Okay, great, okay. All right, so yeah, I, I, I called this uh, Sunday with the chance of electron precipitation and, and I'm gonna talk about sort of space weather. It's sort of a, a phenomenon or a, a phrase that's being used more and more often. So I wanted to sort of explain what it's going on and what we're doing. Um, but uh, you know, one, one, of the, one of the consequences of space weather are beautiful aurora like this, and this is one of my students took a picture of this uh, back in 2011, uh, back when we were uh, coming into the last solar maximum. So uh, let's see, there we go. So yeah, what's up with this space weather term? When I, you know, back when I was a graduate student, more years than I, I care to admit, uh, we didn't actually use that phrase. So it's, it's actually a fairly new phrase, probably started in the early 2000s going on, but it's now really caught on. And so there's, there's now journals for the Space Weather Quarterly, there's a Space Weather Magazine, uh, you know, there's there are, uh, conferences, the American Meteorological Society now has a section called Space Weather section as well. Uh, and and you know even even the Canadian website has a space weather uh, portion as well, and the NOAA, which is part of our National Weather Service in the U.S., uh, now has a space weather prediction center as well. So that's all sort of been going on in the last few years, and and it sort of culminated in this uh, National Space Weather Strategic Action Plan that came out of the White House. Uh, it actually started in the previous administration, well, two previous administrations, and came out in 2019. Um, and just just to sort of go over what they were looking at, it's, it's enhance the protection of national security, homeland security, and commercial assets, operations against effects of space weather, develop and disseminate accurate timely space weather calculation of forecasts, and also establish plans, procedures to respond to that. Uh, it, what it comes down to is, is basically uh, uh, we, we have a more and more uh, um, uh, 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 electronic society now that that uh, can be affected by if uh, by space weather effects, uh, which we'll go into as we go along. And and so the question is, how do we how do we take care of that uh, for the sort of big event that might be coming up? And, and really, there's sort of two main types of infrastructure uh, that we're worried about, uh, and that's satellites and and the power grid. Uh, satellites, the effects on those are, are satellite communications, either from the satellite to the ground or vice versa. And it also turns out that trajectories can be affected quite a bit, and I'll try to go through some of that as well. And the power, the power grid. Uh, I'll try to work you through uh, the, uh, especially aurora can produce very large currents. Those currents can induce currents in power grids, and they can actually lead to power disruptions. And we've had a couple of cases where that has actually taken down a power grid. It's been a while since that's happened, but it could happen again. We need to, we need to understand uh, how that can happen. So. Okay, so where does space weather happen? Well, basically everywhere. Uh, everywhere outside the surface of the earth is, is where space weather happens. Um, uh, uh, first thing, this, this, is a, this is a figure I use a lot from NASA, but it's, it's important to remember this is not to scale uh, in lots of ways. Um, the sun is over here. Uh, all the stuff associated with the sun is pretty much to scale, but obviously the earth is, is not to scale with that sun. It should actually be about the size of one of those stars down there. And clearly the distance between the sun and the earth is not to scale. But, but uh, if we did that, we would have to have a very, very wide screen in order to, to get them all on the same scale. Um, so the sun, the sun is uh, the sort of the source of all uh, the issues going on uh, with space weather. Uh, and, and this is a mixture of sort of phenomena and the impacts, but uh, you get solar flares, you get things called coronal holes, uh, you get a solar cycle, which changes the number of, of this, the sun spots as it goes along. One of the proxies for what the sun is doing is this F10.7 centimeter radio emission. Uh, that's something we measure all the time. Uh, there's a solar EV that radiance that affects the upper atmosphere of the earth. And you get these large uh, you know, magnetic storms that are really called coronal mass ejections. Uh, 
Uh, and in between the sun and the earth, uh, you get this constant stream of particles called the solar wind. And you also get these solar radiation storms, which are, are uh, typically X-rays and gamma rays uh, that come from some of these solar flares as well. Um, now, all of that uh, affects us by interacting with uh, our region of uh, magnetic, uh, uh, our, ma our magnetic field. Uh, that region that, that um, uh, is dominated by our magnetic field, we call the magnetosphere. Uh, we get geomagnetic storms, and, and consequences of that are you get aurora. Uh, the upper atmosphere has got an ionosphere, and you get things like that that they're called total electron content, ionospheric scintillation, and ground induced currents, which we'll talk about a little bit more, uh, a little bit as we go along. Um, the the scale of this magnetosphere to the Earth is actually pretty good in this case. So that's that's you know those are a, just a long list of all the things that can happen in solar or space weather. I'm not going to touch on every single one of them, but I'll try to work through some of those and, and describe uh, what we know and, and how we, uh, uh, how we uh, characterize it as we go along. So let's, let's first start about, uh, this is always a good question, is where does space actually begin? We, you know, we, live, in a, we live in a very uh, rare place in the universe, a place that's not dominated by charged particles or, or even significant number of charged particles on the surface of the Earth. Um, and so somewhere up above us, uh, we transition from uh, our atmosphere into space. And there's a sort of a debate about when that happens. And there are lots of ways to define that. Uh, but typically, uh, typically 100 kilometers is sort of touted as when you get to space. And if you're, if you're a, a, a billionaire trying to sell rides on your own rocket, then, then getting to 100 kilometers seems to be you know, the, the uh, standard for beginning into space. Um, so I just wanted to go, go over some of these things because there's some interesting things in this plot. It's a little bit busy, uh, but along the bottom, I've got the particle density. So the number of particles in the cubic centimeter, so like the end of your finger, uh, how many particles are in there? And this goes all the way from one all the way up to you know, you know, billions of billions. Um, on the left, I'm showing how many charged particles there are. Um, and you can see starting at about 100 kilometers is where you typically you start to get these significant number of charged particles. Um, the black line here is the number of electrons, and then the other colored lines are the different species of the ions that go along with that. Now, one thing to note is, is that if you add up all of the lines in each of these, it's a log scale, so it's a little hard to, to see that. But basically, at all altitudes, the number of electrons and the number of ions is, is constant. And so our ionosphere, that's this, this region that has a significant number of charged particles called the ionosphere, um, that region is what we call quasi-neutral in that, that the number of charged particles, positive and negative, are, are equal. So there's no net charge, but there are cer certainly a significant number of charged particles that are up there. Uh, over here, this is all of the neutrals, and that, that includes all the species, oxygen, nitrogen, and then all the trace gases, carbon dioxide, and argon, and those sorts of fun things, helium and hydrogen. Um, the interesting thing is, even in the ionosphere, where, where we would call this definitely a plasma, which is, which is a gas with a significant number of charged particles, in our ionosphere, even at the at the uh, even at the highest uh, peak of the ionosphere, uh, the charged particles only make up about one percent. So the real elephant in the room, when you're dealing with the upper atmosphere and dealing with uh, how it affects our upper atmosphere, is really the neutrals still dominate, uh, and and uh, we'll we'll get into that a little bit as we go along. But anyway, so the, the, the answer to this is basically space starts anomaly about 100 kilometers. A lot of things that happen here. The, the ions start to come in. Uh, the ionosphere starts to be created. You see this inflection here that has to do with the species up here actually turn out to be oxygen atoms rather than oxygen molecules like we have down here. I also show over here there's there's several names for uh, four layers of our atmosphere. We live down here in the troposphere. People kind of know about the stratosphere. That's where ozone things are happening. Mesosphere is often called the ignorosphere because it's hard to actually get there and measure things. Rockets go right through it. You can get some uh, balloons in there and, and do some things. And the thermosphere is anything sort of above this 190 to 100 kilometer. Yeah. So uh, a lot of detail there, but I, I think it's important to remember some of these details uh, specifically that uh, even though we have lots of charged particles in the upper atmosphere, they're, they're typically only about 1% of the total number of particles up there. Okay, so, so what really drives most of our solar uh, or our space weather here on Earth is, is the solar wind. Um, there are some other things to do as well. We'll talk about those, but it's really the solar wind, and it's it's fun to understand what the solar wind is. So you know, we know all the sun is hot, and and if you if you think about getting a cup of tea in the morning, putting it on your table, and and having the sun shine in the window, 
what do you see coming off the top of the sun? Well, you see some steam coming off there because some of the particles in that T are hot enough to sort of escape the surface and come off. The same thing happens with the solar wind. Uh, the sun is very hot. Uh, some portion of the, of the population of those particles are hot enough that they can actually come off. So there, there's this constant stream of uh, charged particles coming off the solar wind. And a surprisingly large number, this 10 to the 36 uh, particles per second. And the, it's always fun to do this. Uh, <laughs> if you write out 10 to the 36, that's what it looks like. Um, that actually corresponds to about 6 billion tons per hour. Uh, but the good news is the sun is very large. And, and even over the next few billion years, we're talking about maybe 1% of the mass of the sun will come on solar wind. So not to worry. Uh, particles are predominantly electrons and protons, so basically just hydrogen atoms split uh, in two. Uh, some, some statistics here, typical values at the radius of the Earth by the time it gets out to where we are, it speeds about 400 kilometers per second, and that's 400 kilometers per second, not kilometers per hour. So it's really zipping along. Uh, the density is about four particles per cubic centimeter. So if you remember what we saw on the Earth, that's, that's uh, pretty low compared to what we have on the uh, atmosphere of the Earth. And that's for cubic inches, about 65. Uh, and the magnetic field, uh, so there's charged particles out there, and so there get currents associated with that. There's always some sort of magnetic field associated with that. Uh, it's about four nanoteslas, you know, it, it varies quite a bit. Uh, just as a reference, Earth's uh, magnetic field near the poles is about 60,000 nanoteslas, the same units. So you can see it's, it's pretty small. Uh, but it, it runs into this very large uh, magnetosphere area, and so it has a, a, a large interaction with that. So, so what happens? So this is... Uh, there's a lot of things that go on. And, and in fact, you know, there's, there's millions of dollars of research that go on every year to try and understand all this. So there's no way I'm going to be able to explain everything that goes here. But, uh, but generally what people are interested in is, is what are called coronal mass ejections. And this little movie kind of describes one of those, or at least tries to uh, give some uh, 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 top level activities that happen with this coronal mass ejection. So here's the sun. Uh, you watch this movie or, or you watch uh, uh, something develop on the surface, out comes this uh, blob of denser solar wind. Uh, it moves, in this case, moves right towards the Earth. It hits our magnetic field. It compresses it. And it actually does things like sort of uh, streams that magnetic field back. And all that stuff uh, ends up uh, accelerating electrons down. And you get this funny looking blue aurora, which I'm not sure whether made of blue, but there it is. Um, so, uh, like I said, there, each step in the process is, it, 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 there's a lot of detail in that. I'm not going to go through all that. Uh, the primary note, what I want to note is each of these is sort of moving something in, in the magnetosphere. And if you're moving something, you're, you're transferring energy. So, so all of this process is basically transferring energy from the solar wind into our magnetosphere. Uh, and that's what sort of creates our, our uh, space weather locally. Uh, this figure on the right is, is showing one aspect that's really important here. Uh, like I said, there's a, there's a magnetic field with the solar wind. If it's pointing north, it actually just sort of uh, rolls by our magnetosphere and doesn't really interact with it. It sort of compresses it maybe if it gets more dense, but it doesn't do that sort of uh, magnetic breaking and, and uh, uh, transfer. And so we don't get as much activity, uh, at least in terms of rural activity and space weather activity. So it, it, it turns out the solar wind orientation makes a big difference. So solar wind is facing south, or BZ south, we call it. It does interact here, and I'll talk about that in a bit more later on, but that's, that's what sort of rolls these magnetic fields around, compresses them, and, and makes the aurora, but it also drives other currents and, and uh, uh, makes other space weather effects in the uh, upper atmosphere. So that's an interesting movie. Uh, it, it's really great to, I don't know how many people uh, spend time looking at this, these SDOs, Solar Dynamic Observatory, which has been up there almost 10 years now, or a little bit over 10 years now. Uh, anyway, these are very high resolution uh, cameras that are looking at several wavelengths uh, of the solar uh, emissions. Um, these are uh, far UV and extreme UV uh, uh, wavelengths, um, but getting really amazing uh, detail of what's going on in the sun. And what I'm showing here, this is just a loop going back and forth. This is actually a really detailed image of one of the coronal mass ejections, how it starts on the surface of the earth. And then you can also look later on, we'll see a, a movie from cameras that look further out and you can see that chronal mass ejection figure out. Uh, but uh, if, uh, I, I, can, I can spend days watching all these SDO movies. They're just great to look at. And, and I, 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 I'm not really in, into the solar physics as much as I am into the, the ionospheric stuff. But uh, these, this really has to be sort of a game changer in, in what we understand about solar physics now. So that's one event. So that, that really is primarily just purely a, a coronal mass ejection. That's just basically 
sort of stores up a whole bunch of these uh, solar wind particles and then they come out in this big blob. And when they hit Earth, that's just a bigger blob that bumps into there and it creates more excitement, more in the world. People are, people in you know, Minneapolis and, and uh, St. Louis are watching the world, which is us here in Fairbanks. Um, but uh, another, another uh, type of event that happens on the sun uh, are solar flares as well. And, and they're, not, they're not unrelated, they're, they're often very well related. But in this case, uh, this is the shortest wavelength, so the highest energy uh, wavelength that the SDO measures. And you can see as this loop goes by, it's actually saturating right here. So this is very, very energetic particles that are coming out of there. And that includes uh, X-rays and probably gamma rays coming out of there. And so not only do the particles that come out of this uh, probably uh, create a, a, a total mass ejection, but these, uh, these very energetic electromagnetic particles, basically photons, can also change the upper atmosphere uh, change the ionization rate of the upper atmosphere. And you can actually see that in, in some aspects. So that's kind of the source. Uh, when, it, when the solar wind gets to the Earth, uh, several things happen. One of the main things that happens is, is when that BZ is facing south, we get this what we call reconnection here. It actually breaks the field lines in front and they get dragged back, like uh, basically shown here. They get dragged back over the, the pole and sort of reconnect back over here. Well, if, 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 if you know much about how uh, a dynamo works or a, 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 you know, a generator works, if you're changing a magnetic field, you actually end up producing electrical force or basically a voltage. And we see it all the time. Here's, here's a measurement of basically the, the, the voltage uh, uh, at, at the top of the ionosphere uh, uh, measured by several different means here. Uh, and, and when we get these events that are, that are moving these magnetic field lines right here, we actually get something like 60,000 volts difference between this portion of the, the ionosphere and that portion of the ionosphere. So in this case, we're looking from the side. In this case, we're looking at the top of the Earth uh, near the ionosphere. This is, this is noon and this is midnight. Um, and so as these, as these magnetic field lines move through here, they basically uh, essentially separate the charge. But what they basically do is create a very large voltage across there. And that draws, that drives electric fields and, and uh, voltages in the upper atmosphere. Uh, and that's very important for what we see on the ground and how that might affect uh, uh, our uh, infrastructure on the ground. And one of those is that um, during auroral uh, precipitation, during auroral events, uh, the aurora is actually ionizing the, uh, the ionosphere in more detail or, or higher densities locally. So you've got now something that looks more like a conductor, sort of like a wire, and you've got a voltage from uh, these uh, magnetic fields rolling by. And when you get that, uh, you actually create pretty strong currents in the ionosphere. And, and this type of uh, event has got a special name called an, an elect auroral electrojet. Uh, these are very strong events that can produce magnetic perturbations that are measured on the ground, and they're on the order of a few percent of the Earth's constant magnetic field. So these are these can produce very, very large changes in magnetic field locally. And I'll talk about that in a bit more, why that's important. So I said the two things that are, that are really affected by space, whether are satellites and uh, 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 you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the electrical system on the ground. Let's talk a little bit about satellites. Uh, you can go to several sites, but this is, this is one I found that's, that's kind of fun. Uh, and, and see all the different satellites that are out there. It's, it seems like everybody now has their own satellite. Um, this is this is from the Esri Com Com Corporation, and they're tracking about 19,000 satellites. Here's a, a wide view. You've got all the geosynchronous stuff here, as well as what's on the Earth as well. And then I zoomed in here just to show some of the low altitude orbits, because that's that's kind of what's uh, in some ways is what's more affected by sort of space weather. Um, it's uh, you know these. It's important to remember that these these satellites moving in these low Earth orbits are moving about eight kilometers per second. So uh, if you if you don't know your satellite timing as it goes over within one second, it could be eight kilometers different place. Or if you reverse it, if you want to know your your satellite position to one kilometer, you've got to know when it's going to go over to within a few hundred milliseconds or so. So the timing on these is is very important. A small change in position can can create a very uh, very uh, significant change in the timing. Uh, a lot of these uh, satellites can divert themselves, other ones cannot. And some of this stuff is actually space junk, which is just sort of chunks left over from launches and that sort of thing as well. So uh, as you can imagine, this, is, this looks pretty crowded. I mean, I mean, as you zoom in, there's actually a lot of space between these. Uh, 
but they're all moving. They're all moving pretty fast. And there are, there are times when you will likely get uh, very close effects. And, and uh, what uh, has the largest uncertainty uh, in when that might happen is the neutral atmosphere in the upper, in our upper atmosphere. Um, so when, when we drive through those currents I was talking about, and if you have active ultraviolet light from the sun, uh, that can change an into the neutral particles in the upper atmosphere. And that's shown here. Uh, so this is, this is over one year, 2003, 2004, which is a previous uh, solar, solar max period. Um, what's shown here is the AP is an index of, of how much magnetic activity there is based on the, the aurora. And the F10.7 I talked about, this is the 10.7 centimeter, which is a proxy for how active the sun is. Uh, if you look at the density of the atmosphere at 400 kilometers, so if, if you have your satellite at 400 kilometers, this is the density it would see in some sort of numbers. But what's important here is, is on a daily or on a few day basis, that density can change by factors of two. So if you're expecting, if you're expecting to have, you know, four times 10 to the minus 12 kilograms per meter squared, uh, it, it may be, uh, you know, in January 15th, you actually had six or eight or something like that. Um, that's, that's important because even though, uh, even though the density is very low up there, a factor of two can change your timing by quite a bit. And like I said, that can change when the satellites or two satellites might uh, come near each other very closely. Uh, so this change in density, this uncertainty in density is actually the largest un uncertainty in the uh, trajectories for any of these satellites right now. Uh, you know, uh, Newton's laws are quite, quite easy and Kepler's laws are quite easy to chase down. They're, they're very deterministic, but then you add this uh, un, uh, drag in there and uh, things can change quite a bit. So he, here's an example of, 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 of how that can be affected. This was, this was a, a satellite that was, that was um, uh, scheduled to, to re-enter. They knew it was re uh, losing its altitude and was gonna re-enter at some point. Uh, this is back in 96, it might be a little bit better now, but, but still is probably comparable. Um, so on 14th of July in 2013, um, they uh, uh, were still predicting that the reentry time was gonna be on the 17th of July, but the uncertainty was plus or minus 21 hours. And so if you were worried about that, where that was gonna come down, whether it was gonna come down over a populated area or not, uh, you had no idea to be able to, to predict that uh, in, in uh, 21 hours is several orbits as it goes around. So it could basically come down anywhere. So again, uh, the, the, largest, uh, the largest factor in this uncertainty is just the density of the upper atmosphere. And that's driven by space weather uh, and several forms. Uh, the other thing we talked about for satellites or I mentioned for satellites is, is communication. Here's, here's a, I got a couple of examples of, of how it can be uh, affected. There, there are lots of different ways it could be affected. This is kind of a fun one. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I spend my time looking at the upper uh, latitudes, uh, polar latitudes, but the lower latitudes are also effects of uh, space plasma and, and space weather as well. Uh, in certain cases, they can create these plasma bubbles um, and, and they lead to regions of low and high ion density in the ionosphere. You see that in these all sky cameras that are looking at a, a red line emission, which is also a red line seen in the aurora. Um, but you see these regions of, of uh, low intensity, which is an indication of a low density of the ions, and, and you see regions of high intensity, which is high ions. And they also modeled this over here, and they were just showing the density of, of the electrons in that region as well. Well, these, these change in density look like uh, different index for refraction. So they look like, uh, if, you're, if you're shooting a, a radio wave through that, it looks like a lensing effect. And so uh, if this is a case where they, they were looking at a message from a satellite, flying over one of these uh, changes in density. And as they did that, instead of the, the, instead of the uh, ray from the satellite to the ground being direct from the, the satellite to the ground station, uh, because of that index or refraction, uh, the, the, uh, the radio wave was actually diffracted and, and uh, you know, uh, lost its intensity at places and, and gained intensity at other places. And so there are places where you, you went below the receiver, the capability of the receiver to actually uh, to make sense of that. And so the, the message here gets quite jumbled because you lose, you lose the information there. So, so understanding that, you need to understand what frequencies you're working at and, and what the ionosphere will look like when you're trying to speak uh, between a satellite and the ground station between them. Very high frequencies are, are typically not a problem, but uh, lower frequencies 
uh, that are close to what are called the plasma frequencies of these, of these regions can be a problem. Uh, so that's one effect on communications. Uh, so uh, I really haven't talked about Aurora, but let's talk about what causes the light in Aurora. That's, that's uh, that one portion of that uh, movie. We've got uh, electrons coming streaming down uh, when that uh, magnetic field sort of re, uh, snapped back together. Uh, those high energy electrons come down and bump into atoms, molecules. They, uh, might, they might ionize them. They might also just excite them by bumping into them. When they get excited, they want to, re, uh, they want to fall back down to the ground state. And so they put off a little bit of light. And that light has specific colors because of the, uh, the atoms and molecules up there. This process is similar to what you see in a neon sign. And this happens between about 100 and 200 kilometers. Again, that 100 kilometer, uh, that number comes up again. So the reason I do that is because I then get to show a nice movie of the world, which is always good. This is a this is a this is an off the shelf camera that you can buy now. This is a Sony A7S, uh, you know, running at at uh, uh, thirty frames per second, watching the aurora. So uh, it's pretty amazing. When I when I started uh, doing optical stuff way back when, you know, a camera that could do something like this was you know several hundred thousand dollars, and now you can buy a two thousand dollar camera. And go out and make these kind of measurements. Uh, and I mentioned the, the colors. The, the green in the aurora is from atomic oxygen. Uh, this sort of pink lower border when you get the really active aurora, that's from nitrogen. And that's because you're down to low enough altitudes that you're bumping into the place where nitrogen now becomes the dominant species. Uh, and we can use the ratio of these colors when we, when we use uh, uh, when we get better cameras and determine how energetic the particles are that come down and do that. But well, one thing that happens with the aurora is, is if you use a, a different method of, of measuring that, and that's in this case, we use this incoherent scatter radar that's at a focal point research range. Uh, it's operated by SR International. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's a phase array. ISR used to be these big dishes that would steer around. And I say about a phase array, you can sort of simultaneously steer beams in different directions and sort of build up a two dimensional or three dimensional uh, look at the sky. But what that does is, is one thing that IS infrared scatter radar does is it looks at the density of the ionosphere uh, as a function of the range gate. And in this case, you look in different directions. And so you can see at different altitudes, you're seeing different uh, ionization uh, or levels of uh, ion density. Uh, and if you lay that out as a function of time versus altitude, you get sort of the time history of what's going on. And it's clearly here, there's stuff going on at about 100 kilometers uh, that's creating ionization. Uh, creating higher density, and then it sort of fades away and, and uh, disappears. Um, the nice thing you can do is, is uh, 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 this is a sort of independent of whether you're seeing the aurora or not, but if you take the cameras that I run at Poker Flat and combine that, so you take one of those beams now and combine that with the, the imaging now, I move ahead so you can see that. Now you can see again, here's the, here's the density as a color code here. As the aurora moves across these beams, and it gets brighter, uh, you can see the uh, density in those beams goes up. And so basically, as the aurora moves across there, you're just, you're just uh, confirming that uh, you're producing uh, ionization in the ionosphere. Uh, and so you're producing uh, regions of high density of electrons and, uh, associated with them. Now that's important again, because, because as you see, that actually changes pretty quickly. Um, and so when you go to a higher frequency uh, radio wave, unlike what we're talking about before, say a GPS, which is up in you know, a few gigahertz. Um, there's also effects on, on the GPS signal coming down when it sees that those quickly changing regions of uh, electron density in the upper atmosphere. So what I've done here is I've, I've mapped out an all-sky camera and, and, and you can see sort of the coast of Alaska. This is a poker flat centered here. And I map it out to a certain altitude, which I think is 100 foot far away, which I usually do, uh, for this, this blue line emission, which is, which is ion, ion line emission. And then what I'm looking at is what's called scintillation. So I, you know, as astronomers, you probably use scintillation to look at how the stars twinkle. You know, I mean, scintillation is the same thing as twinkling stars. Uh, for GPS, it, it has to do, there are two kinds of scintillation. One is the, whether the amplitude of the signal coming from the GPS receiver changes. And in this case, it's actually the phase of the GPS signal coming down. You can sort of measure when you expect the peak of the sine wave, the, the wave coming in to change, and you can see how much that changes. And so what I've done here is here are several different GPS satellites, and this is where 
<coughs> excuse me, this is where uh, the line of sight from Poker Flat to that satellite goes through the ionosphere at 110 kilometers. And the size of the cross here is how much that, how much that specific satellite or signal is scintillating uh, during that time. So it, we got a special receiver that can actually measure the scintillation. And what you'll see is as this aurora moves around, it's fairly active aurora, you can see as it moves around, as it crosses where that, that uh, <coughs> pierce point is for that satellite. Wow. Yeah, as soon as the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as soon as the aurora goes in there, all of a sudden that GPS signal is now being affected pretty significantly. Um, so I always think about this when I'm, I'm flying into Fairbanks and there's a, a lot of aurora and I know that the, my Alaska Airlines flight is coming in on a GPS approach. That makes me a little bit nervous. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's not quite true because um, the, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the most most GPS receivers, if they see that much uh, change in the in the phase, will actually drop that satellite from the from the solution for the position. But uh, but uh, this is very interesting to see that, uh, and we're trying to understand this. And and uh, so not just for these not just for these frequencies for GPS, but for other frequencies as well. We want to understand what's going on. So let's go back to some some basic physics again. So we we did Faraday's law earlier. Let's Let's go look at the Bio Savart law. I, I love this picture of Jean Baptiste uh, Bio. He looks a little, he looks a little <laughs> bumpy there. Um, but these guys, these guys sort of did the opposite of what uh, uh, Faraday said. They said if 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 you drive a current, uh, you will produce a magnetic field, and it turns out to be it's proportional to the, the current, and also falls off at the distance. That's neither here nor there. Now, remember, I talked about these lower electrojets are creating these very strong currents. And so, so we're driving those currents, and if you have a magnetometer, a sensitive magnetometer on the ground, uh, you can actually see changes in the magnetic field, and that's what I talked about earlier. Uh, so these are fairly large changes. Like I said, the, the total field is about 55,000 here, and you can see these are changing over 1,000 nanotesla out of 55,000. So it's you know, about 2 or 3% of the, of the total magnetic field that's being changed. And also notice how quickly they're changing. I mean, these are hours, but uh, in, in a couple of minutes, this thing has changed by a few hundred nanotesla. And, and if you work it out, that 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 turns out that can produce fairly large uh, uh, currents in large structures. So let's go back to Faraday's law again. Faraday's law is basically what makes a generator work on the simplest level. So if I've got a bar magnetic here with north and south, so there's a magnetic field going through here, and I sit and rotate this wire loop around there. The, the total magnetic flux going through that wire loop changes as it rotates around. And as you change that magnetic flux, that changes this, uh, uh, what we call EMF, which is basically a current going through there. So in this case, I'm changing the magnetic field by rotating that, that loop around. But what if I change this magnetic field and kept that loop uh, constant, you would get the same effect. So basically you would draw, you would draw uh, a current uh, through this loop and, and it would go through whatever resistor or closing off the circuit you've got there. Well, let's go back here. Here we are. We've got we've got a case where we're changing magnetic fields fairly rapidly and fairly large changes in magnetic fields. Let's see what what is what's a large uh, loop of a conductor that might be nearby where we're looking at. Well, there you go. Um, we've got uh, large transition lines. Even in Alaska, we've got a couple of inner ties uh, that that are stretched uh, three or four hundred miles and are, are you know, multiple cables. Uh, and they're separated from the ground from a few tens of meters or so. And when you add all that up, you can actually drive fairly large DC or wet semi-DC currents into the circuit that's really an AC circuit. And the transformers that, that deal with uh, changing that voltage of that AC circuit don't really like to deal with DC currents moving in around there. Um, and so there are cases uh, the, one of the most, uh, at least the, the last one that I really know about was 1989, Hydro-Quebec, uh, during a very large uh, 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 geomagnetic storm, uh, actually lost uh, a, a trip to a couple of the transformers, and that sort of caused a, a cascade of power outage for a while. They were out for about nine hours or so. Uh, and then later that year, uh, Toronto Stock Exchange, uh, again, there's some is issues there, and that took some microchips out of the current. The same uh, March 13th, 1980 storm, which by the way, saved my master's thesis, which is a nice one, um, uh, took out uh, uh, this uh, um, 
uh, transformer in New Jersey as well. It was a New Jersey public service. So, so uh, you know, this was kind of the one time that people had really uh, seen these, these geomagnetically induced currents uh, impacting power grids. Now, now the, the, the power companies have taken note and they've, they've actually uh, done some, they've done some, uh, uh, they, they made some changes to their power grid now uh, that are much more safe. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're still sort of waiting for one of the big ones to come along and, and whether that's going to be, uh, whether the, what they've done is, is uh, enough or not. Okay, so, um, so luckily I'm, I'm a little early on, on this, but I'll give some time to answer some questions. But uh, so, oh no, I've, I've got a few more things here to do. So predicting space weather. So just like terrestrial weather, uh, space weather requires observations. And, and if you're gonna make predictions, we have to have some sort of observations. So if you're gonna make a predictions about what the weather is gonna do, you need to know what the temperature and the pressure and the winds are doing somewhere and be able to see what's gonna go on. So you put that into a model and see what comes out. Space weather is the same, but uh, in this case, we're very primarily driven by just sort of one source and that's the sun. So it's important to sort of watch the sun. And I talked about some ways we do that. Uh, there are some three different time scales to think about when you're looking at making space weather predictions. Uh, and that's a solar cycle, I'll we'll talk about that, a solar rotation, and then the solar, sort of the time it takes for uh, these particles to get from the sun to here and, and when we can actually sort of see that. Uh, people sort of know about solar cycles. Over an 11 year period, the sun actually reverses its magnetic field orientation. So instead of, you know, for a while, the north is to the north and then north is to the south later on, north is to the top and north is to the bottom 11 years later. And during this process, this, the sun experiences the, an increase in the number of sunspots. And it's actually the most sunspots when the, 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 the solar magnetic field is the least well defined. When you've got the strongest north-south field, then that's actually good when you get these minima down here. But it's fairly irregular. Um, but you can see um, it's about an 11-year cycle between uh, minima or maxima, however you want to look at it. Uh, but if you look a little more closely, there's some there's some interesting details going on. And in fact, the last three or so, we've actually had sort of this double peak going on, and we're, we're interested to see the next time whether that's going to continue or not. Um, so this is this is looking at uh, uh, the last. Uh, five or six cycles we've been through, and, and you see we're starting to roll up in the next cycle. Here's the last cycle and where we are in the next cycle. So this is a prediction based on uh, multiple years. This is a several hundred year uh, 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 data set. And so they do lots of uh, uh, fun and games with uh, time series analysis to sort of predict what's gonna go on. The nice thing, at least in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, being able to watch the aurora here in Alaska, tourism, that sort of thing, is, is that it looks like the sunspot number is actually rising a little bit above the prediction. And that would, that would be nice. The, typically, if you get more solar sunspot activity, uh, you tend to get more active uh, solar uh, storms and that sort of thing. Now, that's, that's great for tourism, but of course, if it ends up being one of the big storms and, and knocks out power grids, that's not a good thing. So you know, you've, you've got you to balance those things out. Uh, and so, so the solar cycle, if you look at that, that's the red here, the same sort of, same sort of uh, plot. If you look at what's called a monthly KP, which is basically an index of, of uh, uh, auroral activity, you see, you see they're fairly well correlated, but there are times when uh, as the sunspot number goes down, you're actually getting, you're actually getting increased uh, 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 act auroral activity as well. Um, uh, there's, there's some reasons for that, uh, you know, um, but uh, in general, the, the more active the, the sunspot number, the more active the aurora is going to be. Um, so that's one way to know uh, what prediction or, or when, when you can expect probably the best auroras or the most active space weather is probably when the sunspot number is the maximum or maybe a little bit afterwards. So there seems to be a little bit of a longer. So that's, that's a long term look at when you might expect solar activity. So uh, the next one is just a solar rotation. Uh, the sun rotates on a nominally a 27 day period. Um, and so if you've got an active period, say like this sunspot uh, creature here, if that, if that uh, created uh, maybe a coronal mass ejection last time it came around, it's very likely to do that again. And so you can, you can make up plots of the uh, solar activity or, or the activity of aurora and the, uh, uh, on the earth uh, uh, you know, repeating every 27 days. And there's a fairly good periodicity. It sort of shifts a little bit. Uh, 
the nice thing is these these creatures or these features don't tend to move in longitude. They may move a little latitude, but uh, they're, so the 27 day works pretty well. So that's one thing I tell people: if 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 you know if on February 1st you had good aurora, then probably on the 27th there's a good chance you'll have good. So it's a chance thing, but it's it's uh, it's there. And then the short term. Um, We've got, we've got, this is the Soho Lasco instrument. It's watching the sun all the time and it's looking for these coronal mass ejections. This one probably didn't come toward the earth, but they can, they can sort of determine when they're coming at the earth. And if you see that happen uh, on a typical coronal mass ejection, it takes two to three days for those particles to show up at, at the radius of Earth's orbit, one AU. Um, so you get a little bit of a prediction that way, or at least a little bit of a, a warning that way, uh, knowing whether it's come. So two to four days ahead of time. And then finally, <laughs> that out of the Lagrange point, which is basically where the sun and Earth's magnetic, or not magnetic field, excuse me, gravitational fields balance out, it's easy to sort of station keep some satellites there. And there are several satellites there, including this LASCO, but also including, and the SDO is out there, but also a couple of satellites that are measuring uh, parameters of the solar wind. And that includes the magnetic field I talked about. That's important for whether that's going to uh, produce large uh, space weather on the Earth. Also talk about the, the other direction, the density of that, and also the speed as it was 25. Uh, and, and this distance out here, given that 400 kilometers per second we talked about earlier, gives about a, a one to two hour uh, time frame for when, uh, when you might start to see effects and, and when you might see aurora. So uh, when we're doing sounding rocket emissions and, and want to launch into good aurora, we sit and watch this quite a bit and, and urge this line to go down here, which is when you get uh, the best aurora. Uh, and sit there and watch that quite a bit um, uh, as a short term. We, we know there may be CMEs coming, but uh, this is this is the way we're sort of understanding. It. Okay, so now, uh, so summary. Uh, uh, again, I didn't I didn't get into to some of the things, but uh, you guys can ask questions all you want. Space weather has the potential to affect billions of dollars in infrastructure. We, there, there are lots of satellites up there. Some are very expensive. Some are cheaper. Um, it, it affects both civil and scientific, and as well as commercial and defense operations. So. So uh, um, it doesn't happen very often, but there is a risk that it could happen. And that main risk is a, sort of a big event. I didn't really talk about it, but in 1859, there was a very large solar storm. Uh, we didn't have, we didn't have uh, the power transmission grids that we have now. We certainly didn't have satellites in 1859. But the one grid they did have back then was, was uh, telegraph lines. And there were actually, uh, there were actually people who were sparked, uh, shocked, uh, trying to send uh, telegraphs back and forth across the U.S. because, again, those large changes in uh, magnetic field uh, produce very, very large currents and, and uh, could, could produce very large voltages in those lines. So, uh, you know, we haven't had something that big uh, in the modern era. Uh, if we did, we're not sure whether we could survive that or not. But people are thinking about that quite a bit. So the main focus of our research is characterizing the response of both the ionosphere and the upper atmosphere and to predict our infrastructural response. So, how are the satellites? Are the satellites? Uh, uh, are, you know, how much are the satellites going to slow down or change their orbits? Um, how will communications change uh, if we get if we get uh, really really dense or high uh, density uh, patches in the ionosphere? And it's a global effort, and it's an international effort. We we work with uh, enterprises from Japan, of course, Canada, uh, and several European countries as well. Here in Alaska, so it's it's fun to do that because it's it's, it's great to, to meet people who are interested in this as well. And so so that's what I have for talking about space weather. Uh, you guys may have other questions. You may have questions about this, or you may have other questions about sort of aurora research in general. And I'm happy to answer those. <laughs>